I'm Adam Ketchmarchi, the Executive Director of the National Drowning Prevention Alliance, and you're listening to the Ask the Masters podcast. Welcome to the Ask the Masters podcast. This was a great conversation with Adam, and we really discuss how Adam got involved with NDPA. Uh, But then towards the end of the program, we really get into kind of some nuts and bolts ideas of how our industry can do a better job at raising awareness and and, and talking with our clients to decrease drowning and and just do a much better job within the industry to, to take this very serious issue um, seriously. Stay tuned. This is a great episode, and we hope to hear from you on the other side. All right. Welcome in to the Ask the Masters podcast again. Today, we're continuing the conversation that we've started. Uh, We've had a number of podcasts now on uh, drowning prevention and kind of opening these discussions. And uh, so we have the guru today. Uh, (laughs) So we have Adam, who is the executive director of the National Drowning Prevention Association. Alliance. Alliance. Okay. So uh, Tell us a little bit about you and then uh, kind of what NDPA is. Sure, sure. So I'll kind of give you my background and how I got into this. Um, So I was originally going to go to college for journalism and uh, intern for a TV station for two or three years. Uh, But I always had this childhood dream of being a lifeguard Mm. and uh, took my first lifeguarding class when I was 15. Almost didn't pass. I was told Mm -hmm. by the instructor, maybe you want to try next year, but I pushed through. Uh, I got a job at my local pool and I kind of fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I did some research online. I kind of really wanted to make a career out of this. And I'm from Western Pennsylvania. And, you know, our pool season is uh, three months a year, maybe if the weather works with us for a year. So uh, when I went home and told my parents, no, I'm not going to go for journalism anymore. I'm going to go to Slippery Rock University because they have an aquatics program. I think I gave my dad a mini stroke mm. um, so he wasn't sure I was going to make a career out of that. And uh, so I went to Slippery Rock just knowing that I wanted to get involved in aquatics in some way, you know, like teaching kids how to swim, like being a lifeguard, like managing a pool, um, got really into the pool chemistry side and the management side, the operations side. Um, and while I was at Slippery Rock, um, the professor that led the program, his name was Bob Ogorek, and he was president of NDPA at the time. Okay. And we hosted the conference um, in Pittsburgh that year, so really close to the university, and we were kind of our local host committee that year. And I just kind of thought, oh, this is cool, something different. I really didn't kind of understand drowning prevention and the whole sure. water safety advocacy side. Um, when I made it to uh, the conference, that was the first time I met a family who had lost a child to a mm. drowning. And up till that point, I always, I knew it was an issue. I knew it was out there, but I had never been able to put a face to it. Sure. And when I interacted with these parents and, you know, I always approached as, you know, practicing water safety, I could, you know, recite the Red Cross phrases and, um, you know, be water smart, that kind of stuff. And when it was your job, you're a lifeguard, you you save people. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, that kind of touched me. Um, so I did more and more research on it, and um, I worked with Mr. O'Gork more and more, especially on the drowning prevention side, and I kind of geared myself more towards that angle. And uh, when I had graduated from Slippery Rock, I had the opportunity to join NDPA's advisory council um, and sat on the advisory council for a year, kept going to the conference every year. Since Pittsburgh, I've been going to the conference every year, wow. so i got a decade under my belt now. And um uh, when I joined the advisory council, got more engaged, met more and more families who had mm. lost a child. And I got really involved in the research side of this. Um, I joined their board of directors in 2012. And at the time, NDPA was going through a little rough patch. Um, we were kind of having an identity crisis, figuring out where we were going next. Um, and I was an ambitious graduate student. Mm. So, and I had the time cause I was in school and I said, you know, let me, you know, work with this. So I joined the board, um, eventually became secretary, vice president, president. And at the time we didn't have an executive director. So I was managing the day to day of the operation. So I just kind of dove right in. And what I love about NDPA is we are all about all drownings, all water safety topics, all bodies of water. Um, our goal and our vision is we can't prevent drownings alone. Mm -hmm. Um, it's going to take a village. You sure. know, we all have to work together for that common cause. Um, so kind of what my job is with NDPA is I'm kind of the master behind the curtain, you know, pulling the strings. 
Um, I talk to people. I, my job is to kind of know what's going on in water safety and drowning prevention and try to bring more people into this alliance so we can all work together to prevent that, uh, you know, all the common causes of drowning. Yeah. And uh, one of the big things that in my research that I have discovered is that, uh, you know, drowning, there's two spikes in drowning. I actually just learned this about mm-hmm. uh, two months ago that you have, uh, you know, the number one cause uh, for, is it one to four? One to four. Um, uh, accidental death in one to four is drowning i mean that's a shocking statistic it's higher than motor vehicle accidents yeah Um, you know it's it's for that one to four year old category number one is drowning number two is motor vehicle accidents and in my experience when you talk to a parent about that um they're they had no idea exactly they had no idea and i recently just learned a statistic from the cdc that if your child isn't caught by a birth defect Mm -hmm. that's not the cause of their death the most likely cause next is drowning wow that's above childhood cancer, motor vehicle accidents. And the scary part to me is, you know, I live and breathe this every day. So mm-hmm. I think everyone knows it. Right. And it's it's always humbling to me when I talk to a parent or, um, you know, unfortunately, I talk to just countless parents. You know, I've talked to some who lost their child 20 years ago to a drowning. Um, I've talked to some who just lost their child last week. Mm. And the most common thing I hear from those parents is, I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't know the risks. I didn't know ways to prevent it. And that tells me we need to do a better job. Sure. Not just NDPA, but anyone who touches aquatics, right? Anyone who touches the swimming industry, the pool industry, the open water industry, we all have to make this a a focus area. I I even think, uh, I want to even think broader than that is Mm -hmm. that, you know, this is just a, this is a humanitarian effort. I mean, really it's, even not even looking at just the aquatics industry, um, you know, I mean, the uh, the other stat that I heard on the on the drowning of littles is that um, 70 or 80 percent of those happen in a swimming pool, mm-hmm. um, you know, and so that's really where my heart is within my industry. But then, you know, you, you get into that second spike of yep. I think it's 11 to 15. That's open water. And so many people, when you think drowning, you think of a child falling in a swimming pool. But yep. realistically, this is encompasses, you know, all, all citizens of the world. Well, let me give you another surprising statistic. Two thirds of drownings are adults. Really? Yeah. And they're more likely to drown in open water. Um, mm. You know, yeah, you're right. One to four year olds, the most common place they're going to drown is pools. Um, you know, not saying there aren't some open water drownings, sure. um, but you're exactly right in that um, early to late teenage years, we see another spike. And unfortunately for both of us, it's males. Um, yeah. About 70 to 80% of drowning victims are male. Well, and they're all trying to show up. <laughs> that's very true. Very true. Um, so yeah, and, and, and unfortunately that holds true at those younger ages too. Um, we see more male drownings than females. Um, but yeah, at that, at that teenage years, we see a, an increased spike and One of the things that I think is just so exciting for me, um, uh, there's some legislation being proposed in New Jersey right now that's to uh, mandate public schools to teach water safety as part of their curriculum. And um, I've been learning more and more about the law. And one of the things that I learned most recently was it's not just addressing the young kids. Mm. It's making it K through 12. And to me, that was like, I I like started jumping up and down for excitement because I'm a nerd like that. <laughs> and when I heard that, it just made me excited because we we don't address it with our teens. You know, we talk about drunk driving, you know, we talk about um, all sorts of safety issues. Mm-hmm. But I remember back to my high school health classes, no one ever talked about water safety. No. And yeah, you know, we're going out to the lake to the week for the weekend, we're going floating down the river or whatever, you know, you're doing for fun. And at that age, you start mixing in all sorts of things and sure. you, you know, take the risk taking behavior. They want to show off, as you said, especially the guys. And unfortunately you end up in a, in a dangerous situation. Yeah. There was a, I'm sure you read the story last week about the, um, college, mm-hmm. uh, football player, 26 or something, yep. you know, uh, yep. on his way to being a pro athlete. I mean, not a, not your prototypical what what you would envision that just Mm -hmm. drowned um Mm -hmm. you know and african-american and and just the um you know i I like what you said earlier off camera you said that that drowning does is not uh doesn't discriminate you're right Um, yeah it doesn't you know uh, but the access to swimming um you know for the african-american community actually the non-white community across the country you know the numbers are are significantly higher yeah yeah 
that's you know I don't I, I don't know exactly how we can um, you know tackle some of that. I think starting mm -hmm. you know in the pool in the in the schools and 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 giving access to everybody. Um, yeah. You know I think that's a great start. So I mentioned earlier you know my background is a is a researcher and um, I, I've done a number of research studies around water safety and drowning prevention and you are right you know the the CDC statistics or you know what they have published on the web is a little bit old regarding uh, minority communities and their drowning rates, um, but they are still probably fairly accurate, where mm -hmm. some African-American children can be at a five times higher risk of drowning mm -hmm. than their Caucasian counterpart. Um, same thing when we look at, uh, you know, one area for for children with autism, drowning is the number one cause of death. Really? And a lot of that is um, they don't know how to swim and they get access to the water. And uh, the best way I've ever heard it described a child with autism, you know, uh, some children will look at it and say, okay, this is the deep end. I need to go to the shallow end. Mm -hmm. Not saying that, you know, they're still not at risk, especially if they're out there by themselves. Sure. Children with autism can't distinguish that in many cases. Um, and one of the most, one of the things that people underestimate with drowning is they think, oh, if my child gets in a situation, I'll hear them calling for help. Right. And that's not the way drowning works. Mm -hmm. It's uh, when you enter what we call the instinctive drowning response, that's that 20 to 60 second fight for survival. And your number one goal during that time is a basic instinct of getting air. Mm -hmm. And if you've ever tried to, you know, blow all your air out of your lungs and call for help, right. it doesn't work so well. Um, and that's where I've heard it from parents, you know, oh, I was in, I was in the next room or I was outside with my child and I didn't know it was happening. Yeah. And that's, that's tragic. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it's it's the the one thing that I've learned over the years too is when you have a tragedy, uh, mm -hmm. drowning, um, cancer, any any sort of loss of a child, mm -hmm. um, you know, the the stats are like eighty percent of marriages don't make it after that, and, and yeah. so just you know, just from that standpoint, I'm a family guy. My wife and I have been you know together since high school we've been married 20 plus years and mm -hmm. and just that whole aspect of 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 keeping families together you know that yeah. it's it's it, the trauma that it places is, is staggering well and it's not just on the parents but think of the siblings yeah you know of the of the children i mean i've I, i've talked to families who have, have children who have non-fatal drownings and some who um you know may have obviously had some injuries after the accident mm -hmm. but overall you know turned out okay and it's still traumatic for their siblings yeah. because they watched their their brother or sister almost die mm -hmm. and what that did to their parents and it can affect families for years yeah so um let's talk a little bit about um how do we how do we start addressing this? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, uh, we put this up on our Facebook page and got, you know, kind of a number of, of different ideas from holding parents responsible, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, teaching it in school, mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, I think, you know, there's some merit to all of that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the thoughts that I have is if the spike is between one and four, um, you know, if we wait till school, mm -hmm. we we're, we're missing it, you know, so, so what, what do you guys see as, as kind of the pathway to really opening this conversation and really moving the needle on this? Cause you know, I think you said earlier that, that, that the rate of drowning is really pretty flat. So we're not, it, yeah. it's not, um, it has been for about the past two decades. Um, you know, if you look from 1980 to 2000, we've seen a pretty big drop in our drowning numbers in the U S um, going from about 2.7 per 100,000 uh, residents to uh, we're down around 1.2, 1 1.1 okay. 1 right now, but we've been at that level since 2000. Okay. Um, so, you know, it fluctuates year to year. Some years are worse than others, but this year um, seems to be uh, stacking up to be a not good one. Too. It's, it's not. And you know, USA swimming um, tracks preliminary drowning data and this year is right on target with all the rest. Mm. And it's, it's, it's hard because you see so much advocacy work we're doing and it's kind of demoralizing sometimes to see those numbers. And, um, you know, I said to someone, I got really upset. I was boarding a plane back in, uh, the beginning of June and I had just gotten the really, the monthly drowning report from USA swimming. And I'm thinking, you know, we're making such a big impact. It's getting such great attention and the numbers didn't change. Mm. They were the same as year after year. And that's frustrating. Sure. Um, but, you know, but to your point, you know, what do we do about that then? Right. Um, what's kind of the next step? Um, 
I look at this in a number of different ways. Um, you know, the first being we have to increase our messaging. And so many times from parents I hear, it's not going to happen to me. And the unfortunate part is it's not going to happen to you until it does happen to you. Right. Um, and that's not to put a negative spin on it, right? My, I, I grew up in the aquatics field. You know, I love swimming. I manage a commercial pool um, for the university I work for, and I love getting more people in the water. Um, but we have to address the safety aspects of this. Um, so one, I think it's increasing our messaging and making parents aware that this is a risk factor for everyone. You know, if every parent in the country would look at this and take this as a serious issue, it would make a huge impact. Now, I'm thrilled to report the American Academy of Pediatrics um, recently revised their statement. They used to say that they were... Uh, they didn't want children in the water learning to swim till about age five or oh, they wow. were open to younger, but they really wouldn't make an official stance. They just re-released that statement this year saying at one years old, your, your child should be in the water getting okay. some skills. So skilling the child, you know, the other piece to this, yeah, it's educating parents. Um, but a, a parent who had lost a child actually put this in my mind. And he actually is a, uh, my vice president for ND, NDPA right now, um, Blake Collingsworth. Mm -hmm. And Blake's mantra has been, we have to educate the child. It's not just educating the parent, but it's educating the child. And, you know, sometimes that, you know, yes, are the kids going to break rules? Are they going to, if you teach them to, you know, no, you can't go out or get in the water unless mom or dad are with you. Sure, you, you know, they may break those rules. But don't think that your child isn't capable of understanding that. Set those guidelines. Set that information. Um, the other thing is everyone who touches water in some way has to get involved in this. Yeah. It, it, we've got to quit ignoring this as an issue. Um, and, you know, that's easy for me to say is the National Drowning Prevention Alliance, sure. right? My job, job is to be, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, you know, coming in, I, the beautiful part of my job is I get to work with all different segments in the aquatics industry. You know, even though I came from the commercial pool side, I'll be honest, I don't know how to drive a boat. Boating's not really my thing, mm -hmm. but I get to talk to the boating safety people all the time and the boating community and the law enforcement officials with boating, and they know they have a role to play. And um, the pool service industry, the pool builders, um, you know, the lifeguards, the swim instructors, the hospitals, the public health officials, everyone has a key piece to play in this. And I think that's also what makes it challenging is, you know, it, there's not one magic pill. And with many issues, mm -hmm. you know, you see, OK, we can attack this with two or three different groups and make this a public issue. Well, drowning affects so many different industries, so many different pieces that we all really have to work together to start making this an impact. Yeah. And that's that's really where. Um where I hope to strengthen the industry that I work within, uh, you know, residential pool construction. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for, for many, many years, we've kept our head in the sand and, and, you know, you mentioned the word drowning and people are not going to buy pools. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think the commercial aquatics has done a fairly decent job with mm -hmm. creating safety in that. Yep. And, and so, uh, you know, that's really my goal having you here on the program and really kind of, you know, opening these conversation is mm -hmm. that, um, you know, this doesn't have to be a negative and, and we need to stop, you know, kind of, you know, keeping this, the ugly stepsister in the back room, you know, yep. we, the, the reality is, is that we build pools and that yep. we put a dangerous item in the backyard, mm -hmm. but you know, in the same respect, you put your car, you put your child in a car and they can die from that. Yeah. Um, electricity can be dangerous if it improperly used. And so, so I really want to uh, just reframe this, the whole conversation around, you know, it's our responsibility to, mm -hmm. uh, to, to be pushing safety. Uh, you know, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, Collingsworth. Um, uh, I pass out the Josh the Otter book. Yep, that's um, same, you yep, know, I mean, yep. it's just a, it's a great tool to use that's geared towards the children, yep. you know, and, and let's start having the conversation with the kids, you mm -hmm. know, uh, all my young families that we do, I, we buy them by the case and we pass them out. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, one thing with the industry that I mean, I will say, you know, I've, I've been in drowning prevention now for uh, close to a decade and when I first came in, I really got a lot of resistance mm -hmm. from especially the residential industry. And um, I, I, I'm happy to report that's changed over the years. Um, I was thrilled, uh, you know, just uh, under four years ago, the Association of Pool and Spa Professionals um, started working with NDPA mm -hmm. and um, taking us to trade shows with them 
and getting our messaging out. And we work with them now on a lot of their water safety initiatives. And um, hopefully that's going to continue with the Pull and Hot Tub Alliance. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think you and I share a mutual friend in Jeremy Smith who works in in Dallas and is a pool service professional and uh, works closely with IPSA. Um, You know, Jeremy's my best buddy when it comes to backyard pool safety. Yep. Um, and he, he puts it the best way. Um, you know, I, I'd love to be able to walk into someone's backyard and start handing out drowning prevention. But if I walk into someone's backyard, I'm going to get shot. Right, exactly. <laughs> you, know, you guys, especially the service professionals um, and the builders, you have that relationship with that client. Mm-hmm. And to be able to go in and give them not just a fun place in their backyard to enjoy with their family, but also show that you care about them and you care about their children's safety and you want them to enjoy the product you're putting in their backyard, but do it safely. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that's huge. Um, you know, Jeremy tells me all the time that, you know, when he goes to his clients and drops off water safety information, they're appreciative. Um, they share it with their children and they said it kind of, it not only makes the backyard safer, it makes the family safer, but it also builds that rapport and that relationship that you really care about your client. Yeah, exactly. It personalizes you and it, it, it just, you know, just the relationship building side of it is, is yeah. so critical. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's also a um, uh, you're you're endearing them to yourself. You know, yeah. so it's it's a good business practice, too. You yeah, know, it's, absolutely. it's um, you know, there, there's obviously the overarching, uh, you know, the the humanity uh Uh, to it and and just treating them as individual people but you know um if they if they have a choice between you and somebody else and and you know you're caring about their children and giving them information guess what they're going to choose you all the time exactly and you know i think a lot of goes back to how we prevent drownings is striking the right message with parents um because so often i hear well that's not going to happen to me Mm -hmm. or um you know they 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 don't take it seriously enough. And, you know, what we've done with NDP over the past years is trying to figure out how does that, what kind of messaging resonates with parents where they'll actually pay attention to this. Mm. Right. And the challenging part is, you know, if we make it too simple and don't have that emotional tie in, then they don't pay attention to it. But if you make it too sad and all we do is focus on, well, you know, look at these children that we've already lost and share their stories. A lot of people don't want to be sad during their day. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's finding that right, balance point on that message to say, yes, this can happen to you. But, you know, one of the, we say a lot of things with NDPA, but drowning is a hundred percent preventable. Yeah. hundred percent preventable. Um, you know, I can look at uh, every drowning incident and, and not assigning blame to people, you know, it's an accident in, in pretty much every case, but there are things we can do to prevent future drownings. And if we approach that with families and that right message and strike that right tone, hopefully we can make a huge impact. So um, what is, you know, you've been doing this for a decade. What mm-hmm. are some of the real keys? Uh, you know, because there, are, uh, here in California, we, you know, the legislature has really mandated a lot of things with our new construction. Some are good, some are not so good. Sure. Um, you know, where, where do you guys stand and what are the kind of the, the key most important things? I know, uh, you know, uh, layers of protection and, and that, uh, yeah. but, um, you know, share a little bit of your insight and what you've discovered. Yeah, you, you took the words out of my mouth. It's layers of protection, right? Um, it's not just one thing. There's not one magic pill that's going to fix this. Um, so the first thing is not only educating the child, but skilling the child, making sure they're confident in the water. Mm. Um, yes, I mean, even great swimmers can have a drowning accident. Right. You know, it's it just because you know how to swim, you're not drown proof. Um, just because you've taken lessons on learning to float doesn't make you drown proof. Just because you have a flotation device on doesn't make you drown proof. Um, I know a horrible incident from my local community where um, a girl was out on a canoe, had a uh, life jacket on and canoe tipped over. She struck her head on uh, or struck her head on a uh, bridge support when the canoe capsized and knocked her unconscious. Hmm. So the the life jacket kept her up and she was floating face down. No one could get to her. So um, not one single thing, you know, you had in that incident, you had the protection element of a life jacket on, but Mm -hmm. that didn't protect against all accidents. Right. So it's knowing how to swim. It's also, um, you know, recognizing we can put all these prevention steps in place, but what do you do if something happened? Right. You know, bystander CPR is super important. Mm -hmm. Um, Knowing how to effectively perform CPR and, One of the things that um, 
unfortunately get missed when it comes to drowning is we talk a lot about hands only CPR right now, right? Where, you know, the American Heart Association came out with that about 10 years ago, and it was to get for cardiac arrest, which, you know, obviously affects a number of Americans getting quick, you know, compression started on the chest. But for a drowning incident, it's not just compressions, right? It's adding those breaths in to the mix. So getting proper CPR training, having uh, a, a phone nearby to call 911 if something happens. Um, it's designating a water watcher. Yeah. It's also thinking about, you know, a lot of drownings happen during non-swim times. And that's something that we don't think about a lot, right? We think, mm. well, drowning is going to happen when we're in the water or plan to be in the water. Well, that's not the case all the time. Um, you know, a lot of times it's the child made their way out. We, we made a PSA um, probably about eight, nine years ago, and it was a Mission Impossible theme okay. where, you know, there was a toy in the pool area and the kid tried. They were in the living room and they, you know, climbed up the wall and figured out a way to get out to the pool area. And, yeah, it was a comical approach to it, but it was it was true. Right. I mean, you know, how are you protecting your pool during those non-swim times? How are you preventing that access? So, like I said, it goes back to those layers of protections, um, barriers around the pool, making sure uh, the child knows how to swim, uh, making sure uh, you have good response with that, making sure you're using proper flotation. Um, those water wings. Mm. I know everyone sighs when you hear that, right? But And I, I thought, you know, eventually they were going to quit selling it, but I still see them pop up, right? Yeah. Um, but it's 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 a multifaceted approach. And like I said, I wish I had the one magic answer that's going to solve this problem. But it's getting that messaging out to parents, making sure that they're uh, skilling the child, making sure they're educated about it, uh, have a plan in place. And again, put in those barriers. You know, I know we were talking a little bit about certain types of alarms and what sort of things you should have in place. And, you know, it has to make sense for your family, right? Sure. You know, um, it's just like when the fire alarm battery starts to die in your home or the smoke alarm. Yeah, yeah, unplug it. Yeah, right. You know, oh, I don't have a 9-volt battery, so I'm just going to take this out of the wall. And then it sits there for two weeks and, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, you don't have an alert when you're sleeping and, you know, there's smoke in the house. So it's the same thing of making sure the barriers that are in place. There's so many options on the market. Pick yeah. one that's going to work for your family that makes sense and it's going to protect them. Um, the biggest thing I can say is don't don't take the cheap way out on this. Right. You know, you're going to regret that if you find yourself in an unfortunate situation. Yeah. So what are some of the options? Uh, you know, I mean, you've obviously you've got safety covers, you've got mm-hmm. uh, door alarms, you've got gate alarms, you've got, uh, you know, one of my personal favorites, um, uh, the little um, uh, safety turtle, safety but, turtle. Uh, yep. the bracelets, the kids seem to love those. Um, you know, uh, I'm not even up to speed on all of the, the, yeah. gr- there's some new ones that are really coming out that I've heard are really, you know, Oh, it's an exciting market right now. Yeah. Finally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, I I'll say it's a, it's a new and innovating market. Um, you know, I've seen some products come in and quickly go out of the market and you've seen people try different things, but the innovation is really happening in the drowning prevention, especially on the technology side. You know, for years it was just the fencing, the door alarms, the safety turtle's been there. Um, some of the commercial pools, you know, we had Poseidon that was out there as a recognition tool, but was wildly expensive right. for pools. Um, that market, the more and more innovation that happens, the more and more products that make it to market, the more cost effective mm-hmm. that they're able to produce these products, the better it is. Uh, there are some really cool products out there on the market right now um, from artificial intelligence technology that's able to recognize um, drowning posture, drowning positions or where someone's at, um, detection tools like Safety Turtle. Um, it, it's an expanding market. Um, and I think it, it's just at its early infancy. Um, yeah. You know, there's more and more coming out every year. I hear of new technologies and new things coming out. Well, and that's what I hope, too, is that I can kind of uh, awaken the industry. We have so many brilliant minds within mm-hmm. the residential construction side. I mean, just look at some of these crazy pools hanging off cliffs. And, oh, it's awesome. You know, yeah. and, and, and so there are really brilliant people within my marketplace that uh, if we can just all kind of start to open this conversation and start to brainstorm, you know, yeah. the solutions are out there. We don't even know what they are yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and just to be able to find, you know, more viable solutions that are, that are going to be long-term realistic. Yep. Um, you know, my problem here in California is that um, door alarms, you know, they, mm-hmm. Nobody keeps them on, you know, the, the, you look in all the, um, you know, the beautiful magazines and, and this indoor outdoor living, uh, well, the doors have to be open and, yeah. um, you know, so, so this layer of protection that the California legislature has put in place, 
almost immediately and almost universally gets dis- dismantled and disabled. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and so to me, that is a discussion that we need to start having. And how do we, how do we put things in place that are less likely to be disabled by the clients? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the idea with door alarms, they're great in theory, not so great in practicality, right? right? Because, yeah, I mean, it makes sense that if you you have a door going out to the pool, you have an alarm on it. If, you know, your child opens the door and is on their way out to the pool, you're getting that alarm. But, you know, from what I've heard from people is, you know, and even friends of mine who have pools in their backyard, you know, that door alarm's annoying. You know, as soon as as soon as the, the, the inspection's over, they take the batteries out or once the batteries die, they realize how nice it is not having that door mm-hmm. alarm. And yeah, it, it's just not effective. Well, and you can only leave the door open seven seconds. Yep. You know, I mean, that's the thing. And then there's not really good switching for the other side. So every time you walk back into the house, the door alarm automatically turns on. And, yep. you know, you got a baby sleeping in the other room and 90 decibels. Guess what? That baby's not asleep anymore. <laughs> and, yep. Yep. Um, you know, so... Um, you know, yeah, in theory and, 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 you know, it's a great idea, but the implementation is such that it, it very rarely gets long-term. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I, I think this is probably a key factor in this is, and I think you and I started discussing this earlier before we started recording is the industry really has to start taking part in that safety messaging, yeah. right? Because, um, you know, if you're someone who's writing the law, but you're not actually engaged in what's happening in the field, that's, you might end up in this situation, sure. right? So the more and more people get involved in this, who have the expertise, who are innovative, who have these ideas to put forward, the better off we're going to be. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, you know, we're not all going to agree on every safety measure we have to take, right? It's, it's, it's not easy. Um, but the more and more we can have these open discussions and bring people together and, you know, come up with ideas that are going to work for not just um, the homeowner, or, you know, the, the pool manufacturer, but it's going to work for both. Right. Sure. Yeah. And having more options too, you know, we're really mm-hmm. straight jacketed into here's the three things that you have to do. And, you know, in yeah. California, we, you know, they've, they've now, uh, three of the seven, you know, um, I'd love to see there be, you know, uh, three of 70, you know, I mean, let, let's come up with different so that a different you yeah. know, scenarios, we can have something that we can make work for every single project rather than kind of trying to bubble gum something in that's not really appropriate, but it fits the letter of the law. Yeah. I mean, not one shoe is going to fit everyone right. when it comes to this. I mean, um, and you know, this with the types of pools that you design is it, it like I said, it sounds great on paper right. and it sounds great in theory, but the way the innovation is going in the pool industry, the more and more um, things we put in our backyard um, to make it an enjoyable living space for us, um, it's not going to fit what worked 10 years ago. Right. And, you know, what what I feel really excited about, though, with that, it's not to me um, a bad situation is no. we, we see the innovation happening right now, especially on the drowning prevention technology side. Mm. And if that can catch up to this and the laws can be uh, fitted where, you know, we can fit these devices into that, you know, it really then becomes a discussion with the homeowner of what's going to work best for you. Sure. You know, what's going to work best for this type of pool that you've installed for your family. And that's going to create a better safety environment. Yeah. And, and, you know, we watched with VGB and the whole implementation of that, what's that 10, 15 years ago yeah. now, um, we as an industry did not step up mm-hmm. and the federal government came in and and wrote the laws uh, and and just the fiasco of how that was implemented and and yeah it's a great thing and and now 15 years down the line uh, you know we look back and we go okay yeah it's it's um you know but that um uh, that initial implementation and just some of that at the beginning, um, you know, we as an industry did not take the responsibility for drains and, and suction, uh, velocities and things like that. And so, you know, somebody else had to come in and create the laws. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'd love for us to, as an industry, get behind this and really kind of jump in and go, okay, we're going to take this seriously and we're going to figure it out before, you know, the federal government or state governments have to come in and say, yeah, this is a real problem and you guys aren't doing it. So here's the solution. Yeah. What I'm going to say to that is the fact that, I mean, we've got to change something. Yeah. You know, as, as I said before, our drowning numbers aren't changing and we've got to come up with ways to fix that. And mm-hmm. it's it's going to be better if we all start working together on that yep. and come up, coming up with solutions that work for everyone 
versus one side coming up solutions for the other side that are, aren't going to be practical. Right. And I'm not in people's backyards. Right. You know, I, I'm paid to run the Alliance and I, you know, work with families who have lost children and I'm an expert on drowning prevention, but I'm not going out to the backyards. You know, you guys are. Mm -hmm. So having that open dialogue and that communication of what are you seeing? What are we seeing? How can we work together on that? That's huge. That's huge. And that's something that in my experience hasn't happened up until, you know, past couple of years. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, again, that's, that's where I want to try and move the needle, Mm -hmm. um, you know, and really start to start to branch out. And, and like you said, it's very multifaceted, you know, drowning is not only in swimming pools, we can do what we can do. uh, But just the, the access to swim lessons and, and just all of that, you know, I think we, we all can get behind that. And and this needs to be a global thing. This doesn't need to be just the swimming pool industry. And we all need to start to, Mm -hmm. you know, get out of our silos and really work together, you know, across industry platforms. Yeah. I mean, drowning worldwide, you know, we talk about our numbers in the U S and I'm not trying to downplay those numbers. I mean, for a, a first world country that has all of these things in line, our drowning number is staggeringly high. Mm-hmm. Um, but when, you know, the World Health Organization, their global drowning report said 372,000 people as an wow. estimate lose their lives to drowning. That's an estimate. I mean, our our data in the U.S. for as far as mortality rates go isn't super strong. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good place to start. It's an estimate. But, you know, you talk about third world countries, we're just estimating how many people oh, yeah. drown. I mean, it's a worldwide problem. Right. Um, and, you know, I get the question all the time, well, what are you doing internationally? Well, you know, my organization, we're focused on the U.S. Mm-hmm. and, you know, our drowning problem in this country. But what I usually tell people is learn from what we're doing. Yeah. And if we do something and it works, implement it somewhere else. Sure. You know, that's. Um, you know, I, I tend to be, a, uh, an optimist and, you know, the kumbaya person when it mm-hmm. comes to this, but, uh, you know, it works sometimes, sometimes, you know, we all don't see eye to eye, but if we don't start having that open dialogue, those conversations on, you know, worldwide in the U S how we can change this, it's just going to keep going the way it is. Right. And, you know, yeah, I love my job. But I'd love to be out of work one day. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to be able to say, I no longer have to work for the Drowning Prevention Alliance because drowning isn't as big of a problem mm-hmm. anymore. And that's that's just not happening right now. So talk a little bit about the Alliance. What is the Alliance? Uh, you know, yeah. we've got your, your book here, um, Not One More Drowning. Uh, mm-hmm. Talk a little bit about you know, uh, all of the different organizations, how this gets implemented uh, throughout yeah. the country and, and uh, how people can get involved because there's plenty of avenues to get involved. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And um, so starting with the NDPA and what our alliance is, um, we break it down into four pillars. Um, we could probably break it down into 16. Um, and this is where I say, you know, anyone who has a vested interest in preventing drowning should be a part of our alliance. Mm-hmm. Um our initial four categories where we, you know, kind of break down who represents the alliance, um, you know, first is the corporate side, the technology people, the builders, because, um, you know, the, the aquatics industry from a, either a residential or commercial side, it's a business, right? So that business element has to be at play in our discussions. Sure. Um, so we have the corporate pillar. We have our education pillar. Those are the learn to swim instructors, the people who are going out and teaching drowning prevention information, swim lessons, lifeguarding. Um, So the people who are touching for the educational purposes, Um, we have our task force and coalitions. Um, This is probably where I feel the most strongly we need to do better. And there are some great coalitions around the country. Drowning Prevention Coalition of Arizona, Southern California has a great group who works together. Um, In in Texas, you have the Texas Drowning Prevention Alliance. On a city level in in Texas, you have the Fort Worth Drowning Prevention Coalition. There are some great things being done around the country at a local level. Drowning is not prevented nationally, it's prevented locally. Right. And, you know, I can sit here and strategize all day of national plans and, you know, talk about data and things, but I'm not the boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. I'm here to empower the people with the boots on the ground with the information and the messaging and things like that. Um, But that task force coalition piece is huge. They're, they're wildly important. So it's the people in the communities and it's just kind of like a mini version of the Alliance, right? You know, if you're going to make an impact in your local community, you've got to identify your resources. Who are you going to work with? Your hospitals, your first responders, your paramedics, your firefighters. Um, you know, you've got to get some money on the mm-hmm. ground. So how are you going to find that sponsorship locally? Right. So that's another angle of NDPA. And then our final one is families united to prevent drowning. And this is, 
I say it's the why we exist. Mm -hmm. um, these are families who, um, and that's what this book is full of, unfortunately. Um, and I just want to point out that even though this looks like a pretty thick book, that's a fraction of a fraction right. of the number of families who have lost a loved one to a drowning. But what's unique about these families are they looked at this and said, I'm not going to sit here and just mourn, mourn my loved one. They want to get involved so another family doesn't have to experience that same loss that they did. Um, and it's probably one of the most impactful things. Um, said it changed my life. I wouldn't be in this work had I not met that first family who had lost a child. Um, they have a message I can't deliver. Right. Um, because I can sit there and talk to parents all day and say, you know, I, this could happen to you, everything. When a, a mother steps on that stage and says, it happened to me, it can happen to you. Mm. That is the most powerful thing ever. Um, and the work that they do, the energy they bring to this, the messaging they have, it's huge. So that in a nutshell is our four pillars that make up our alliance. Um, but we work with hundreds and hundreds of members around the country. Um, we have uh, partnerships with organizations. We have about 90 different partners right now around the country, ranging from foundations to corporations. Um, so, you know, there's multiple, multiple ways to get involved in this work. Um, what I'm most excited about that NDPA did, um, you know, we've laid a great foundation and we're launching on so many projects right now to uh, really elevate drowning prevention in the U.S. Uh, but we recently just launched a free membership program. And the reason we did that, you know, we sat around and said, well, you know, and I, I had, the, we had this talk, like, why are we going to get rid of membership dues for some people, right? We have a premium membership where people can join and, you know, get some more benefits. But I said at a meeting, every single person who has a vested interest in drowning prevention should be part of this alliance because we all need that number to go down for different, for, you know, for, for all the same reason, you know, we want people to enjoy the water in a safe way. Right. Um, so you know, whether you're a lifeguard, a pool builder, a public health official, a firefighter, you should be involved with this alliance. Um, our number one goal is drowning prevention. And that's where, you know, you said at the beginning, you know, association or alliance. And the reason I'm so glad we're an alliance is because it really, it kind of gives the essence of the effect that we all have to work together for this, right? right? Yeah, you don't join. It's it's your duty. I mean, that that's where I've wrapped my head around, even in the last year, is I've really kind of kind of brought myself around on this it's 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 your duty to humanity you know yeah. uh and and those of us who you know have the joy of building with water mm -hmm. you know we have a responsibility mm -hmm. and in in the internet age you know the say what you will about social media and everything uh, stories get out instantly yep. and um you know none of us want to have that story about a pool that we built uh, that has a tragedy in it i i've met builders who who have had that tragedy unfortunately happen in pools that they've built and um i don't like watching grown men cry right you know but that, and that's what i've seen and um you know the one thing i've heard from builders who have had that experience you know i wish i could have done more mm -hmm. and you know, I don't want someone to end up in that situation, right? You don't want that family to end up in it. You don't want personally to end up in that situation or, or feel that way. Um, and, and there's a way to take ownership of it. You know, there's a way. And, you know, I, I've heard this. I, I'll be honest. You know, I when I first started going to industry trade shows, um, I had people come up to me and point and yell at me saying, you're killing this industry. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a comfortable feeling. Right. But my response to those people were, I want the same thing you want. I want people to enjoy the water. Right. Um, you know, it's not like, I, and I get this question, well, who did you lose to a drowning? I'm fortunate. I have never lost a, you know, a family member to a drowning. Um, I came into this work because I love aquatics. Mm -hmm. I love pools. I love operating pools. Um, and, you know, to me, if, if you can go out and deliver that message of safety, that's a huge impact right there. It's not the only impact we need right. to make. But it's a, it takes us again further down the road than we are today. Yeah, yeah. It, it just it it makes sense. I think that that the timing is right to really, mm -hmm. um, you know, to to start the conversation uh, and 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 continue the conversation. You know, I mean, I I feel like uh, like I said earlier, the, the commercial aquatics has done a, a pretty decent job. They've been mandated into it, but they've also done yeah. a decent job with you know lifeguarding and and that. Um, 
and uh, in, in the service industry, you know, uh, thanks to Jeremy and a lot of his efforts, uh, they've mm-hmm. really, they've moved the needle and, and getting IPSA behind it and all of that, yeah. um, you know, and, and so I think it's, we're kind of at that point now where, you know, the construction side of it, we really need to kind of jump into as well and, and help. Um, so if you could um, boil it down to one or two, like, you know, non non starters like these are the absolute minimums uh, just for for people in my industry what are you do you have one or two things that you know every residential pool should have xyz um, yeah so i i think there's so many resources out there right is if you're building a pool for a family that has children you know give them you know one of the storybooks out there the josh the otter uh the stewie the duck um there there's so many out there mm-hmm. um uh, we have so many resources available um, that uh, you know aren't really going to cost a pool builder much at all no, to exactly. pass over some safety information to the parents. And you know we can boil it down to nine or twelve points for parents and, and pool owners on how to make their pool safer, right? And giving them that message: don't avoid it. Right. Um, you know, I think that's the worst thing anyone can do is avoid the conversation. Um, you know, and I, I've talked to builders before, and I've said, you know, if if someone's at the point where you're you're talking to them about their pool build. They're pretty committed to it at that right. point. I don't think having a safety conversation is going to steer them in a wrong direction, mm-hmm. right? I don't think you're going to lose business over it. Um, you know, and I would turn it to say, I think your your clients are going to appreciate it, right? Yeah. So, and you can start that conversation earlier too. You yeah. know, it's not something that you have to just, uh, oh, by the way, there's your pool and here's your paperwork. You know, <laughs> yeah. you know, start yeah. it at the beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, talk to them. You know, if if you're building a pool um, and there's kids in the house. Um, hey, have you thought, you know, while we're building the pool, maybe getting the kids into swim lessons or thinking about your safety plan for the pool ahead of time? Um, that way, from day one, you can start enjoying it safely mm-hmm. uh, or in a safer way. Um, you know, recommending great uh, products available is huge. So do research on the products that are available on the market. Um, what's going to work? Some of the new and innovative ones that are out there. Um, you know, I will say one of the prohibitive things of that right now is some of the newer technology does come at a higher cost right sure. now. Um, I don't think if you're wrapping it into a, uh, a full pool build, it's going to make that big of a eyebrow raise um, right. versus, you know, if you're adding it in as a after after build, you know, product. Um, so it's having those conversations. Um, it's even educating them about what a water watcher is, mm-hmm. you know, designating one adult, you know, if you're having a pool party and, you know, a lot of people do that, right. As they get their new pool in, they'll invite a bunch of friends over, come enjoy the afternoon, designating one responsible adult who you can trade off, who is not distracted by a cell phone. And one of the other things too, that I, I don't think a lot of parents quite understand right away is supervision, I break it down into active supervision of children and passive supervision in children. What I mean by that is, you know, you can't watch your kid 24 seven, right? You know, you're, you're eventually gonna have to turn your back to do the dishes or, you know, look at your cell phone or something. Take a shower. Yeah, exactly. Right. But it's, it's different when there's water involved, Mm -hmm. you know, and it goes back to that drowning is quick and it's silent. So designating one responsible person who's not going to sit there with a cell phone, who's not going to sit there and read a magazine or be engaged in a conversation for 15 minutes. And they make these water watcher cards and I'm, I'm sure you've seen them. Where, yeah. With the lanyard and yep. the, the laminated and everything. Yeah. yeah. It, that is meant to memorialize the fact that when you are wearing that, your job is to keep an eye on the pool and keep the, keep everyone safe. Yeah. And I think uh, the, the biggest thing that, that, I've heard about that is, is that it needs to rotate. It does. Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. My son's a lifeguard. Um, yep. and, and, uh, they're not allowed to be at any one station. You know, they're rotating around the facility all the time, yep. um, because, you know, you just zone out after a certain amount of time. And so same thing with the party. And plus, you know, who wants to go to a party and, oh, this is my week. I got to be the guy, you know, yeah, for four hours yeah. watching the kids. No, you know, it's 15 minutes and then the other 12 parents are going to take, you know, they're 15 minute. It's the same thing with lifeguards. I manage a staff of like 20 to 30 lifeguards at the university I work for. And it's the same thing. They're never in the chair longer than 30 minutes. And we try to shoot for 15 Mm -hmm. Um, because after 15, it starts getting monotonous. You start daydreaming, you start trying to lose your focus. So it's harder. So yeah, just to your point, you know, rotate that off every so often is, is huge. And um, again, it's these, it, it, we're not reinventing the wheel here, right? right? This is stuff that's already out there. It's been out there for years, but it's a, it, where the builders can come into play is making it uh, such so more accessible to parents. 
Um, and just even starting the conversation, you know, the first time I heard that was probably five or six years ago and I had never thought of, you know, it's yep. such a simple thing. It doesn't cost anything, uh, you, you know, just the, just really educating, uh, you know, it, it just opening that discussion. Um, you know, so many people, you're not going to get pushback on something like that. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. a very simple thing that can do. And, and then they realize, okay, we're making a difference here. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I will bring up again, you know, it's, it's two thirds of our drownings are adults, right? Yeah. So it's, it's also reminding them that it's, we're not just worried about your children's safety, we're worried about your safety as well. Yeah. You know, this is a product that is meant for enjoyment, right? It's not meant to kill you. Mm -hmm. Um, but it can. Yeah. So, you know, bringing up some important points for water safety. And again, like I said, it, this is, this is easy stuff. Um, you know, if you go on to NDPA.org and click on our, you know, basic water safety steps, um, it's a bullet point list, but it's all simple stuff. Right. And it's, if it's implemented, it, it's going to be a huge, huge impact. Yep. So, uh, where can they find you? I mean, you just said NDPA.org. Yep. Um, you know, I've been on the site, uh, you know, there's a lot of information there. Um, yeah. where should we start? Where should we send people kind of at the beginning? What's the, uh, you know, what, where's, yeah, we do, have a, we just relaunched that website this year and we're really excited about it and we're adding more and more stuff to it as, as the days and weeks go by. Um, so it's going to get a little taxing. It's going to be a big library. Um, but you know, go under, re, under our resources, basic water safety steps. Um, what are layers of protection? You know, we break that down for you. We break down, um, other organizations that are out there. Um, you know, we're an alliance. It's not all about NDPA. Right. You know, I can sit here and name off a hundred different resources with drowning prevention, but our goal is to make sure you find the right message. Um, you know, and I, I've said it to, to parents and you know, I've, <laughs> you brought up Josh, the otter and you know, uh, Josh's dad, Blake says it best is he doesn't care if it's Josh, the otter or if it's Zeke the polar bear, or if it's Stewie the duck, whatever's going to connect with your child or your family, go for it. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Um, so just getting people to start doing a little bit of research on it. Um, you know, one thing that we've done with NDPA is um, if you follow us on Facebook, um, we uh, we try to post not just stuff for the aquatics professional, um, but it's we're also gearing a lot of our messaging to the average consumer, the moms and dads, sure. um, to get some basic water safety information. And it's not just all reposting of oh this drowning happened and that drowning happened. It's it's really proactive stuff that you can really take advantage of. So, mm -hmm. um, and the beautiful part about social media is it it constantly gives you a reminder, right? Right to keep this front of mind. Um, so follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, on all of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, part of our audience that we deal with here, too, is, uh, you know, architects and designers mm -hmm. and, um, you know, really even taking it back even before a pool contractor is involved and and just opening those discussions. And, um, you know, because, yeah, sometimes setting up gates and fencing in that it, sometimes it, it has a more broader impact on the overall aesthetics of the property, sure. uh, especially in residential. And, and so, you know, I really want to encourage the design professionals to really start thinking about this as well. You know, it's, yeah. it's a, <coughs> it's really holistic. You know, we really need to kind of, kind of look at this in a broad picture and, and understand everything and, and, and really have that as kind of one of the foundational things that we're looking at as we're looking at integrating water within properties and, and structures. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would say this, you know, we talk a lot about in this country about, um, gun safety, right. Yep. And it's, you would not leave a loaded gun available for right. your child to get access to, right? Mm -hmm. Why would you do it with your pool? Right. You know, and there are a lot of creative ways that you can lock your gun up, right? Mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of creative ways you can make your pool safe. And I'm with you. I mean, I would challenge the the builders to be creative. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be a particular fence that isn't going to go with the visual aesthetics of a pool. I mean, trust me, I get it. If you're going to invest that kind of money in a in a beautiful pool to make your, you know, your backyard just not a place to relax, but kind of a place to retreat and get away from things and, you know, you don't want an ugly fence in your backyard, right? Right. But there are ways where it can be visually aesthetic and pleasing, mm -hmm. but it can also cover that safety element as well. And, you know, I'm not a builder. I, you know, I can sit here and say that, but I challenge the builders, you know, work with us on this, mm -hmm. you know, innovate. Let's innovate. Yeah. 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 There's so much, you know, there, there's so much wisdom and innovation happening. That's, that's really my goal. So I'll, I'll talk right to you. That's really my goal is the, 
uh, as the industry and as design professionals is that let's come up with these solutions. I mean, it's it's the right thing. It's the right time. Um, you know, it, we can find them. The solutions are there. We just have not discovered them yet. Yeah. And I said, this is, it's, it's, we're not trying to place blame or responsibility on one party, right? right? It's, it's, we're all here to support each other. Mm -hmm. We're all here for the same, you know, reason. We want people to enjoy. For you guys, it's a business, right? This is, this is how you make your money. Um, you know, our goal is to help you do that. And, you know, I argue that if backyard pools are safer, more people are going to want to install backyard exactly. pools, right? If, if, if that risk goes down, more people are going to consider putting it. And I mean, I remember my parents, they eventually put a pool in their our backyard because we, we <laughs> nagged them enough right. that we, they, they kind of had to, or they just weren't going to sleep peacefully at night. We work, my sister and I weren't going to let that <laughs> happen, but, um, you know, it, Getting it to that place where it's safer, because that was my parents' number one argument is, I don't want to put this in the backyard. It's too much of a liability. Right. Well, if we can reduce that risk, and you know, trust me, if we see those drowning numbers go down, we're going to talk about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to talk about it. And that's going to get out to the public as well. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a team effort. And that's where, like I said, it's not just the builders. You know, you're, you're a piece of it. And we all have a piece to play. Mm -hmm. That's that's what I want to get, get the message out to. Because so often when I have these conversations, people think that I'm putting the onus just totally on them. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're the ones that have to fix. You're the ones that have to fix this. And it, that's not it at all. It, but, again, spreading it out and getting more people involved that's our message is the alliance that I think we're going to be more successful. Yep. So, uh, NDPA.org. NDPA.org. Yeah. Okay. Um, we will, uh, encourage everybody to go there, uh, visit the site. Like I said, it is deep. It is, there's a lot there. There's, there's, uh, there's plenty to get lost. Uh, oh, but, yeah. but then there's also, uh, you know, the simple stuff. I mean, the navigation and getting to, you know, the, 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 the simple solutions. Um, it's, it's, you can you can get lost in there, uh, but you can also find uh, what you need very quickly. Yeah, and and follow us. You know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Yeah. Our 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 handle is at Drown Alliance. Um, and like I said, we try to really put this in a positive light. You know, um, one of the things that uh, drowning prevention sometimes has a negative connotation. Um, you know, we actually are changing the name of our conference um, mm -hmm. to the National Water Safety Conference, and there's a number of reasons why. But it's because I, I, I want to put this in a different light for people. Sure. You know, water safety is sometimes more of a positive way of spinning it, right? Don't be turned off because it's drowning prevention. You know, this is water safety. This is proactive stuff. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Yeah, and, thanks for having and, me. Uh, yeah, I, I look forward to, you know, reconnecting in five years and, and seeing where we've, you know, the progress we've made. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd love to come back in five years and see those numbers cut in half. That'd be Perfect. huge, huge. So thanks for having me. Appreciate right. it. Thank you very much. All right. Ask the Masters is dedicated to educating, mentoring, and designing a better workplace for the swimming pool industry and their families. Please take a moment to share, like, and review our content with all of those that would be interested.